hello my dear students welcome to my today's online class on recombinant dna technology i am dr meera bk associate professor and head department of zoology maharani science college for women palace road bengaluru 1 you can see my cell phone number and so also email id on the slide after the classes if you want to seek any queries or if you want to if you have any questions you can contact me through any one of the avenues in my previous classes i have taught you about bird's eye view of rdt then we have learnt about molecular scissors molecular glues alkaline phosphatase then we have learnt about different types of vectors cloning vectors expression vectors and in that we have learnt about cloning vectors plasmid vectors farge vectors and cosmids now another requirement of uh, recombinant dna technology experiment is you should know about host cells well you will isolate the dna insert of your choice then you will put it into a suitable vector now what next that recombinant vector needs to be put in a particular suitable appropriate host cell so that whatever the purpose why you are doing this experiment is going to be a success okay now what are these host cells we shall learn in this class host cells the host cells are living systems or cells in which the carrier of the recombinant dna molecule or vector can be propagated okay once your recombinant vector is ready that means vector with the dna insert of your choice you have to put into some cells living systems okay so that the vector along with your dna insert is going to propagate in that particular host cell basically there are two types of hosts depending upon whether you make use of prokaryotic cell as a host or eukaryotic cell as a host okay first let us study prokaryotic host cells by now you must be knowing what are prokaryotes and eukaryotes what is the difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells prokaryotic host cells are mostly the bacteria and for this purpose normally we make use of e coli or escherichia coli and we make use of another bacterium that is bacillus subtilis or sometimes even the species of streptomyces bacterium is preferred so normally we make use of either escherichia coli or bacillus subtilis or streptomyces species as prokaryotic host cells okay then coming to the eukaryotic host we make use of three categories of cells one fungi another one animal cells another one plant cells coming to the fungi we use saccharomyces cerevisiae common baker yeast as the host cell or sometimes people do use another fungus that is aspergillus nidulans okay then sometimes you can make use of animal cells directly as host cells normally insect cells oocytes mammalian cells and whole organisms once a while are used as host cells then coming to the plant cells you use either the protoplast or the intact cells or sometimes whole plants so host cells are normally either prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells 
prokaryotic cells are mostly the different species of bacteria. Eukaryotic cells are either fungal cells or animal cells or plant cells. Now, what a host cell should do? Host cells should effectively incorporate the vector's genetic material. They should readily accept the genetic material of the vector what you have prepared, right? Then the second thing, they should be conveniently cultivated in the laboratory to collect the products. Any host cell, you know, should be, we should be able to cultivate them in the laboratory to collect the products because most of the times we do RDT experiments to get the proteins of our choice which are of therapeutical use. In such cases, we should be able to retrieve the proteins. We should be able to culture them or cultivate them in the laboratory. Okay. Now, normally we prefer microorganisms as host cells because they multiply faster compared to the cells of higher organisms. Okay. Now we shall study one by one the prokaryotic host and the eukaryotic host. Now let us study about E. coli or Escherichia coli. In fact, this was the first organism or the bacterium to be used in RDT experiments. And this continues to be the host of choice even today by many. Okay. And uh, coming to the biology of E. coli, basically it is the simplest gram-negative bacterium. By now, in your practical classes, you must have conducted experiments to identify a bacterial cell, whether it is gram-positive or gram-negative, right? So, E. coli is the simplest gram-negative bacterium. And the major advantage of this is, under congenial conditions, that is under suitable environment, it can replicate once in every 20 minutes. That means in one hour, it can reproduce thrice. Okay. So, and as bacteria multiply, the plasmids, whatever you have put in these bacterial cells, along with the foreign DNA insert of your choice, they also multiply. They produce millions and millions of colonies and uh, you can establish a colony or a clone. Okay. So, the Escherichia coli looks like this. This is a gram negative bacteria. Then what are the limitations? This host cell has limitations also. It causes diarrhea in humans. It causes dysentery or diarrhea. And one more thing, it cannot perform post-translational modifications. What do you mean by that? See, normally, when protein synthesis takes place in the cell, two processes happen. The information present in the DNA is coded down to mRNA that is called transcription and then that is translated in the cytoplasm okay into the suitable proteins right now once you get the proteins after translation directly the protein cannot function it has to undergo few modifications to attain its 3d configuration structure please note any protein is biologically functional when its 3D configuration is appropriate or PAKA. Okay? And that is possible only if the cell genetic machinery has post-translational machinery to have post-translational modifications. All right? And that is not present in this Escherichia coli. These are the two limitations. It causes diarrhea and dysentery and it cannot perform post-translational modifications. Most of these prokaryotic cells, that is the drawback. Okay. Now, another bacterium which is used as a substitute to Escherichia coli is the Bacillus subtilis. 
another bacterium. Bacillus subtilis is a rod shaped non pathogenic bacterium. Okay, it doesn't cause any harm like dysentery or diarrhea, whatever it is. It is basically a rod shaped non pathogenic bacterium. Here you can see the cells of Bacillus subtilis, rod shaped cells. Okay, then it is used as a host cell in industries, especially for the production of enzymes, antibiotics, insecticides in large quantities. All right. And most of the times it is treated as an alternative host cell to Escherichia coli. Okay. Then another bacterial species which is used as a host, another host of choice happens to be the species of Streptomyces. This is how the Streptomyces cocci look like. Okay. So these are the three prokaryotic hosts which are normally employed in recombinant DNA experiments as host cells. Okay. Now let us talk about the eukaryotic hosts. These eukaryotic hosts are preferred to produce especially human proteins because these host cells have complex structure and therefore they are more suitable to synthesize complex proteins and major advantage is they will have all machinery for post translational modifications so that you will get the protein of your choice in a perfect 3D configuration so that it is readily functional. One such eukaryotic host is Saccharomyces cerevisiae which is commonly called Baker cyst. Okay, sorry for the spelling mistake, T is missing. It is also a non-pathogenic single celled organism. And sometimes another fungus is also made use of that is Aspergillus nidulans. But normally people go for yeast cells, okay, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Then, once a while, we do make use of mammalian cells or host cells, especially the mouse cells. See, different cell lines are prepared in the laboratory and readily kept, either from liver, okay, cell lines are maintained and they can be used. What is the advantage? Certain complex proteins which cannot be synthesized by bacteria, if you make use of bacterial cells as host cells, where you can't synthesize the complex proteins, they can be readily produced by mammalian cells. Say for example, there is a protein called tissue plasminogen activator, okay, which has therapeutic value. This, if you want to produce, in a prokaryotic host, it is not possible, whereas if you put the vector containing the gene for this tissue plasminogen activator into a mammalian cell, okay, you can get the proteins to its final form because these cells possess the machinery to modify the protein for its final 3D configuration, that means post-translational modification so that when you retrieve the protein it can be readily used for the purpose that you have designed it okay so this is all about the host cells thank you students for your patient listening any questions you can contact me thank you stay blessed